Hello, welcome to this anticoagulation forum webinar on perioperative management and antithrombotic therapy, the 2022 American College of Chess Physicians Clinical Practice Guidelines. My name is Jeffrey Barnes. In addition to being an AC Forum board member, I'm also a cardiologist and vascular medicine specialist at the University of Michigan. And I'm thrilled today to be joined by three experts in the space of perioperative antithrombotic therapy and members of the guideline writing committee who are gonna help us talk through what these new guidelines have to share. Our first panelist is Dr. Jim Duquetis, who's professor of medicine and vascular medicine, uh, as well as the David Bradley and Nancy Gordon Chair in Thrombotic uh, Medicine at McMaster University in the Hamilton Health Sciences St. Joseph Healthcare System. Jim, thanks for joining us today. It's my pleasure, Jeff. Our second panelist and guest is Dr. Alex Baropoulos. Alex is a professor of medicine at the Zucker School of Medicine, which is at Hofstra Northwell. He's also the system director of anticoagulation and the clinical thrombosis service at Northwell Health. Alex, thanks for joining us. Delighted to be here, Jeff. And our third panelist and guideline author is Dr. Bill Dager. Bill is a cardiovascular pharmacist. He's an AC Forum board member, and he's at the University of California Davis Medical Center. Bill, thanks for being with us today. It's a pleasure. Now, we have over 1,800 people registered for this webinar, which is just a testament to how important these guidelines are for everyone's daily clinical practice. So I'm gonna turn things over to Jim, who's gonna start us off with a, um, an introduction to part of what the guidelines have to talk about in the perioperative space. The uh, objectives that we have is to really review management of antithrombotic agents, talk about some of the important changes and discuss the implications of how these guidelines are affecting our everyday practice. So Jim, let me turn things over to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jeff. Uh, make sure that I can, everyone can see these slides. And first of all, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, once again, it's my uh, pleasure and privilege to represent uh, the group of colleagues that you see here alongside Dr. Sparopoulos uh, and Dr. Dagger, uh, who are the panel that helped formulate these perhaps long overdue guidelines on the perioperative management of antithrombotic uh, therapy. These are my uh, disclosures for your consideration. Now, these guidelines were developed uh, last time in 2012, and since then there's, as you know, been considerable changes, uh, new evidence in how we manage patients who are receiving an anticoagulant or an antiplatelet drug and require an elective surgery. So going from 11, we went to 43 PICO questions and 44 guideline statements focusing in four key areas, those patients receiving a vitamin K antagonist, chiefly warfarin, uh, the use of bridging therapy among those patients taking a vitamin K antagonist, those patients receiving a direct oral anticoagulant or DOAC, and finally, those patients receiving an antiplatelet drug, whether a single agent like aspirin or dual antiplatelet therapy with comprising aspirin and a P2Y12 inhibitor typically. But this is more than just a guideline, a set of recommendations. As Jeff was alluding to, this is an area that involves a wide array of healthcare professionals and everyday practice. So we felt it very important to stress the how-to part of managing patients how to assess perioperative thromboembolism and bleeding, how to interrupt and resume VKA, DOAX, and antiplatelet drugs, and how to bridge with low molecular weight heparin. So evidence guidelines uh, paired with guidance and how to. This is an overview of the guideline development process. I won't go through this in detail, but you will see that we followed a stepwise and rigorous approach in terms of oversight, selection of panel members and disclosures of potential conflicts of interest that would affect their ability to contribute to recommendations 
selection of PICO questions, data sources based both on direct evidence, that is evidence that is directly linked to a PICO, and indirect evidence where it's not directly linked to a PICO, but related and important. The, the guideline framework, the evidence synthesis, and importantly, how we actually came up with the recommendations at the end, you'll see here. So let's start off and just jump right in. And I, I for one, I, as, and the others, want to try to keep this as conversational as possible that, that we can with an audience of uh, over a thousand people. And we will be checking, as Jeff said, our chat and have ample time for Q&A. But this is meant to be very practical. So let's start with a case of a 75-year-old female with atrial fibrillation who is, is receiving a DOAC. It could be a pixaban, it could be rivaroxaban, and has a number of comorbidities that lead her to have a CHAD score of six. And she is scheduled to have hip replacement surgery next Friday, uh, the uh, 16th of September, uh, with spinal anesthesia. So a number of questions that you uh, in, as a pharmacist or a nurse practitioner or a clinician might get is from the surgeon and the anesthesiologist, when do I interrupt the apixaban or rivaroxaban? Is it two days, three days? or five days. And I know there's some tension uh, with the guidelines uh, that we propose and those of other medical groups, for example, the American Society of Regional Anesthesia. And we can discuss that in the Q&A. If I do interrupt rivaroxaban or apixaban uh, for three or five days, do I need to bridge with low molecular heparin? And finally, as we sometimes do in patients on warfarin, do I need to check the anticoagulant, or in this case, the DOAC level before the surgery on Thursday? Now, the guidelines try to address these questions, uh, and I, will, I won't go through the actual studies that sort of provide the background. I, I invite you to look at our uh, published uh, report that provides more detailed background for the justification of each guideline statement. So in patients who are receiving apixaban, let's say, or require an elective surgery, we suggest stopping the apixaban one to two days before the surgery procedure versus continuation. So this encompasses a broad range of patients, including the patient that we discussed just now, who's having what we consider a high bleeding risk surgery. So as Alex will, sit, will discuss later, each of these clinical scenarios is anchored on an assessment of thromboembolic and bleeding risk. And in this case, bleeding risk dictates how long to interrupt the anticoagulant therapy. And you'll see that each guideline actually has a practical pairing. So what we refer to as a guideline implementation consideration. So it, we, in this case, we talk about interrupting a Pixaban one day before a low moderate bleed risk procedure, two days before a high bleed risk procedure such as this. You'll see also this is a conditional recommendation because these guidelines have a very, very high standard for developing a strong recommendation. And it is based on observational studies, non-randomized trial studies that we consider high quality, but nonetheless are not randomized trials. And therefore this is a conditional recommendation. And if we were considering this patient being on rivaroxaban, it's essentially the same recommendation. Indeed, we have separate recommendations for each of the four DOACs. So I'm not going to repeat what I've just said for apixaban, but this would be the case for rivaroxaban. And also we have guidelines for patients on edoxaban and the bigotran. Do I need to bridge with low molecular heparin? Our guideline here says we suggest against perioperative heparin bridging. Again, this is a conditional recommendation based on low certainty of evidence where it reflects observational data assessing the use of bridging perioperatively in a non-randomized study setting. And once again, the, the guideline implement, implementation consideration, forgive me, provides a rationale for that, why uh, we do not advise in favor of perioperative bridging for patients who are receiving a DOAC or direct oral anticoagulant. 
once again, I urge you to look a little bit more between the lines uh, in the in the text to provide that sort of rationale for this recommendation. And then finally, uh, we suggest uh, in patients who have DOAC interruption against routine DOAC coagulation function testing to guide perioperative DOAC management. Once again, this is a conditional recommendation, and there's a bit more of a lengthy explanation or consideration that we offer to uh, practicing clinicians as to the rationale. And we also provide some caveats in terms of when we might consider doing DOAC testing. This is meant to, uh, to be a practical uh, guideline and guidance document. So we are not over circling these questions that come up very frequently in everyday clinical practice. This figure uh, summarizes the entire approach that is used for the perioperative management of patients who are receiving a DOAC. And, and we hope this is one of the, the key takeaways that people remember that they can maybe uh, print and put in their clinic because it sum summarizes the approach for uh, DOAC management. And uh, we urge you to just focus on some key uh, slides or figures that encapsulate all of this evidence. So we said there were four key areas. We're taught, we, we mentioned DOACs, uh, warfarin, bridging, and antiplatelets. So I'm going to do the bookends and talk about the antiplatelets while Dr. Spiropoulos will deal with the VKAs and bridging. And here's another kind of typical case, a, a very simple, straightforward case, if you may uh, consider it. A woman, a man, sorry, who had an ischemic stroke three years ago likely another TIA. We know those can be sometimes difficult to categorize and is having a bilateral inguinal hernia repair that some of us would consider low, moderate bleeding risk. And what do we do with the aspirin perioperatively? Well, we all know there's been new research in the perioperative management of patients who are receiving antiplatelet therapy. And here, our recommendations are is that in patients receiving ASA who are having elective non-cardiac surgery, we suggest aspirin continuation over interruption. This is a conditional recommendation with moderate certainty of evidence. And with the caveat that it can be modified based on the bleeding risk of the patient. So for example, if this patient was having a high bleed risk surgery, maybe we would be interrupting uh, the uh, warfarin depending on how that surgery is categorized. So there is some flexibility built in here to allow for individual circumstances, particularly given the wide array of surgeries. And then the corollary, that's why we have 29A, 29B, is that if we do interrupt, we suggest stopping aspirin uh, earlier than, uh, than uh, the seven to 10 days before the surgery. This uh, figure summarizes the perioperative antiplatelet management. And of course, we also deal with patients having uh, coronary bypass surgery and importantly, those patients undergo who are receiving dual antiplatelet therapy that, and once again, we can discuss this during the chat. So with that, I'm gonna pass the baton over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Alex Baropoulos, who will be talking about vitamin K antagonists and heparin bridging. Thank you, Jim. And I'm going to try to share my screen. Um, seems that maybe we have to unshare so I can share according to what I have here. Is there? Ah, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, as uh, Jim alluded to, I will be discussing uh, the management of uh, patients who are on VKA as well as. Um, as well as the potential need for, for heparin bridging. And Alex, if you wanna put your video, video on, that'd be great. Sure, thank you. All right. So uh, the changes in the 2022 chest guidelines uh, will be profound for the practitioner who's managing patients on, um, on warfarin and perioperative situations. And um, I, I 
did think it important to provide some of the background data because indeed these changes will have, I think, important uh, clinical implications in perioperative uh, settings. For some reason, my slides are not advancing. Let's see. Okay. So in any perioperative management of antithrombotic therapy, I think it's important to um, assess patient and surgical risk factors for bleeding and thrombosis and appropriately risk stratify each of these factors. Now, back in 2008, we developed a three-tier thromboembolic risk stratification scheme with respect to uh, risk of thrombosis when discontinuing VKA therapy in paraprocedural situations, dividing patients into low, moderate, and high risk. And these are the three usual patient populations on, on chronic oral anticoagulant therapies that we would see in our clinical practice based on atrial fibrillation, mechanical heart valve, and venous thromboembolic indications. And as Jim Duquettis alluded to, even though this uh, scheme has not been validated, uh, I think we have found over the last 14 years or so that it, it's extremely useful conceptual model for clinicians and indeed anchors our, um, our guidelines with respect to how uh, we risk stratify patients in paraprocedural settings. Now, a few years later, we also developed a three-tiered surgical or procedural related bleed risk scheme, dividing uh, procedures into minimal, low, moderate, or high uh, bleed risk situations. And again, uh, this has not been uh, validated, but again, provides a very helpful conceptual model of uh, what to do with anticoagulants in paraprocedural situations. So in essence, uh, I think we should all maybe keep in mind this slide, which is important. Um, you're, when you have a patient in your clinic uh, who's on chronic oral anticoagulant therapy uh, and requires an elective surgery, you should be aware uh, and uh, place patient into one of these uh, nine potential categories, including a three-tiered uh, bleeding risk scheme and a three-tiered thromboembolic risk scheme. Now, importantly, it's the... Uh, procedural bleeding risk that determines if oral anticoagulant therapy is discontinued during uh, the procedure, and uh, if it is discontinued, when is the optimal time to discontinue it, where it is the thromboembolic risk, again, on patients on chronic uh, uh, vitamin K antagonist therapy, especially at moderate and high risk, that determines um, if uh, uh, heparin bridging therapy uh, would provide uh, benefits. So I think this is an important conceptual framework. So there are two key questions regarding uh, management of patients on chronic uh, uh, warfarin. Number one, should the warfarin therapy be discontinued? But I think equally as important, if uh, VKA therapy uh, needs discontinuation, uh, should the patient uh, require perioperative bridging therapy with either unfractionated heparin or uh, more uh, usually a low molecular heparin. And lastly, if this is the case, how to bridge with heparin. Now let's tackle this first question. I, I think what we've seen in the last decade or so is that our cardiology colleagues have conducted high level randomized controlled trials, of, of usually in uh, cardiac procedural settings such as pacemaker or defibrillator placement, uh, also catheter, uh, catheter ablation. Uh, in patients with atrial fibrillations that clearly show uh, benefits of a strategy of continuing warfarin versus discontinuing warfarin and initiating heparin bridging perioperatively. Again, uh, uh, the latter approach leads to an increase in bleeding events in procedural uh, situations and paradoxically, at least in, in, in one uh, randomized trial also leads to um, an increase of perprocedural thromboembolic events. So this forms the basis of, I think, one of the more important strong recommendations, there are two in the entire guideline group, namely in patients receiving a VKA and require pacemaker or ICD implantation, um, uh, we give a strong recommendation to recommend continuing uh, VKA therapy as opposed to VKA interruption and heparin bridging. Again, a strong recommendation based on moderate certainty of uh, evidence. And of course, um, there is a, a guideline implementation consideration uh, that you see here 
uh, that uh, uh, is connected to the statement. The, the other statements I think are important. And uh, again, these are based on lower quality uh, evidence from uh, either um, smaller randomized trials or observational studies. And this really have not changed much since the 2008 iteration of these uh, perioperative uh, chest guidelines that in patients who require dental procedures, dermatologic procedure, or ophthalmologic procedures such as a cataract surgery, the suggestion is is that one should continue VKA over VKA interruption. Again, these are all conditional recommendations based on either low or very low certainty of the evidence. We also have added one further recommendation in patients undergoing colonoscopy with anticipated polypectomy, is that if patients are receiving VKA therapy, we suggest against heparin bridging during the period of VKA interruption. But I think perhaps the more important of the two questions, uh, and this is a question that's um, uh, been uh, uh, front and center in many uh, paraprocedural uh, uh, thrombosis practitioners for probably the last 25, 30 years or so, is the second one. If VKA needs to be dis discontinued because of procedural bleed risk, should the patient have perioperative bridging therapy with heparin, and if so, how to bridge with, with heparin? But the bridging therapy um, or the perceived need for, for bridging therapy is really driven by thromboembolic risk. So that uh, in high thromboembolic risk patients, and I've already introduced the uh, purported thromboembolic risk stratification scheme that we've used, the need to, um, to prevent thromboembolism will be the dominant management strategy irrespective of procedural bleed risk. And thus in theory, an aggressive strategy such as bridging therapy is justified. Conversely, in low thromboembolic risk patients, the need to prevent thromboembolism is less dominant. The strategies to avoid bleeding are justified. And in moderate thromboembolic risk patients, a single strategy is not dominant and management has, has to be individualized. But the key clinical question uh, that we have not uh, answered until very recently is simply, do we need to bridge at all? Uh, and I think this is the, the, the most important uh, uh, clinical question because again, bridging involves a very complex paradigm of discontinuing warfarin and initiating bridging therapy, uh, uh, reinitiating warfarin and discontinuing bridging therapy. So data in the last decade or so from large meta-analyses as well as large cohort trials in the three patient populations that I've introduced mechanical heart valve, atrial fibrillation, BT populations on chronic warfarin, for the first time um, had no bridging comparators when compared to uh, bridging strategies. And these studies, uh, interesting enough, uh, did not show any evidence of benefit of bridging therapy with either no evidence of a reduction in perioperative thromboembolic events and paradoxically, some studies showing an increase in perioperative thromboembolic events, and all of them uniformly showing in anywhere from about a three to nearly fivefold increased risk of major bleeding. So it was against this background, uh, and here we have the background 30 day event rates in no bridging arms, uh, an arterial thromboembolic event rate of about 0.5 to 1%, and major bleeding rates of about 1%. So it's against this background we designed the bridge trial, um, and we see here that two hypotheses, these were in atrial fibrillation patients um, who had at least one stroke risk factor. So our hypothesis for the bridge trial was that foregoing bridging anticoagulation would be non-inferior to bridging with low liquid heparin for the prevention of perioperative arterial thromboembolism and foregoing bridging anticoagulation uh, as would, I think most of us would find evident would be superior to bridging with respect to major bleeding. Now, both of these hypotheses had to uh, have been met for the bridge trial to be successful. And the other interesting thing about the bridge trial is that bridging was so ingrained uh, in vascular uh, surgeons, cardiologists, internists, uh, and others' mind that, that the no bridging arm was the experimental arm in the bridge trial. I think so, something quite interesting. This is the bridge trial design. Uh, again, large trial over 1,800 patients with atrial fibrillation. And I won't go through the details, but suffice to say that the way we designed a bridge was to maximize any putative benefits of bridging therapy and minimize any potential harms of bridging therapy. 
So the patients were randomized before the procedure. Um, uh, warfarin was stopped five days before the procedure. Study drug, either adulteprin or placebo injections. This was a, a placebo controlled trial. We started day minus three, discontinued day minus one. And then depending on procedural bleed risk, um, the study drug was we started either within 24, about 24 hours for low bleed risk procedures and 48 to 72 hours for high bleed risk procedures in addition to reinitiation of uh, warfarin. And I think many of you know the results of the BRIDGE trial, numerically almost identical numbers of arterial thromboembolic events in the bridging and no bridging arm, clearly meeting the non-inferiority criteria of the trial, and probably not surprisingly, an over two and a half fold increased risk of major bleeding favoring the no bridging arm. And lastly, in some of the secondary analysis, we see an increase in the number of myocardial infarction events. Um, and when we look at why that may be so, what we see here is the median time to major bleeding event after the procedure was about seven days, whereas the median time to a thromboembolic event was 19 days, suggesting that bridging therapy may have placed a, a patient increased risk of major bleeding, necessitating discontinuation of all antithrombotics, and then putting the patient at risk for downstream thromboembolic events. Now, the other major trial that was published just last year was the PERIOP2 trial. Uh, there were a lot of limitations for this trial, and I won't discuss in detail, but this is another large placebo-controlled trial. And the importance of the PERIOP2 trial is that it included a fairly large amount of mechanical heart valve patients in a placebo-controlled trial of bridging therapy. And this trial found very similar results to the bridge trial. There were no advantages of bridging therapy, whether you looked at the whole study population, the atrial fibrillation subgroup, or the mechanical heart valve subgroup of the PERIOP2 trial. And again, about 50% of valve patients included valves in the mitral position. So based on these two trials and others evidence, um, this was our second strong recommendation in the guidelines. Uh, in patients receiving VKA therapy who require VKA inter uh, interruption, we recommended um, against heparin bridging. This is a strong recommendation based on moderate certainty of evidence. Uh, and underneath you see some of the key guideline implementation considerations that in selected patients considered at high risk for thromboembolism. And again, I refer you back to the three-tiered thromboembolic risk scheme that I discussed earlier. Um, these would be uh, the patients in whom heparin bridging would be suggested. And based on either direct data from the PERIOP2 trial we, or indirect uh, data uh, uh, from other studies in, in the setting of VTE, we also suggested against heparin bridging both for mechanical heart valve patients as well as patients with VTE in indications. And again, uh, with similar guideline and implementation considerations that those patients at high risk based on the thromboembolic risk scheme, uh, we uh, suggested the use of bridging therapy. Uh, and really, this would be the uh, guideline statement in which this was uh, uh, again defined. So, in patients receiving VK therapy who are classified as high risk of thromboembolism, and again, I refer you to that uh, three tier thromboembolic risk scheme that I described earlier, and who do require VK interruption because of the procedural bleed risk. Um, again, we would then suggest heparin bridging over a no heparin bridging strategy. The other aspect of our um, guideline document and something that Jim Duquette has already alluded to is the how-to um, of how we manage perioperative BKA and loma preference bridging if it's needed. So here in uh, figure one, um, again, we, I think, developed a very nice schema on what to do with respect to uh, warfarin interruption, or lack thereof, in minimal bleed risk procedures, and then in low, moderate, high bleed risk procedures, how to interrupt warfarin, um, how to initiate preoperative low molecular heparin uh, bridging, and how to reinitiate warfarin post procedurally, post operatively, as well as um, reinitiating um, low molecular heparin bridging in the uh, uh, post operative situation. Again, these reflect guideline statements that are all conditional recommendations based on very low to low certainty of, uh, of the evidence. Again, they're online clinical decision support tools that are referenced in the, um, in the document. Uh, and to, to conclude then, I hope to have shown you some uh, very uh, major changes in the 2022 
uh, chest guidelines that uh, we all know uh, and we think will impact clinical practice and in essence simplify uh, the perioperative approach of how we manage warfarin uh, in, uh, in various surgical situations. So is interruption of BKAs indicated? We have high quality randomized controlled trial evidence that for many, many cardiac procedures, including uh, pacemaker placement and uh, defibrillator uh, placement, uh, that uh, a strategy of continuation of warfarin is superior to interruption of warfarin and heparin bridging. But I think the most fundamental question that has only been um, uh, answered recently is, is heparin bridging actually even necessary with warfarin? So based on the uh, evidence that I've showed you and based on the results of the now uh, two published placebo-controlled trials, uh, again, uh, we give strong recommendations not uh, to bridge uh, patients with atrial fibrillation indications unless uh, they're at high thromboembolic risk and a suggestion not to do the same in patients with mechanical heart valve, as well as a VTE indications, unless again, uh, they're classified as high thrombotic risk based on the thromboembolic risk scheme that uh, I showed you uh, previously. And of course, uh, lastly, uh, the how-to manage of warfarin and bridging in elective procedures has been validated both in the bridge trial and uh, in other trials as well. So with this, uh, I think we're on time and we can go ahead and open the discussion. We have uh, plenty of time uh, for questions from our audience. Well, Alex, thanks so much for, for that summary. That was great. And Jim, Jim beforehand, I wanna invite uh, Jim and Bill uh, to join me back. We are getting just a ton of great questions from the audience. Some were emailed in ahead of time and many are coming in now. If you have questions, please put them in that Q&A box down at the bottom of the screen. And Alex, if you're able to stop sharing, that'll sort of bring our, our cameras up. I'm gonna start with a question actually for Jim. I know he's uh, pulling his camera up right now. Jim, you alluded to this when you gave your section about sort of this discrepancy between the ACCP guidelines and the ASRA guidelines for how long we should be holding our direct oral anticoagulants, especially for patients who are gonna get a spinal anesthesia type procedure. And I'm wondering if you could briefly help us understand maybe where that discrepancy is coming from, the, the evidence that's driving it, but then perhaps more practically, how, how as clinicians are we supposed to use this in day-to-day -day practice? You know, um, Should we just go ahead with the longer hold because then everyone agrees, or is that a dangerous approach? How do you operationalize this right now? Thank you, Jeff. That's a very important question. And I think each of us gets, gets asked this uh, several times in my case, every week. And I, I first want to point out that both uh, groups of clinicians, anesthesiologists and non-anesthesiologists are aligned in two ways. Number one, we want to we want an approach that is the safest possible for the patient. And in this case, this involves ensuring that there is minimal to no anticoagulant effect at the time of surgery so as to allow neuraxial procedure to safely uh, proceed. The second is that we want to have an interruption interval so that we have approximately five elimination half-lives from the time of interruption to the time of the surgery. And in that regard, both the uh, ACCP and ASRA approaches are very consistent. Uh, if you look at the interruption intervals that are recommended by CHAST ACCP for neuraxial, which is two days off uh, prior to the procedure, this corresponds to about 60 to 68 hours interval, which in turn corresponds to five elimination half-lives for uh, most of the DOACs. Uh, I'm excluding the bigotran in patients with renal insufficiency. That's a different situation, but not widely used. So we're very consistent in terms of the premise of safety and in the premise of uh, elimination half-lives. Where we might differ, perhaps, is how we came to our conclusions. So our conclusions from the ACCP chest are anchored mainly on clinical data. And this is primarily from the PAUSE study, from other prospective studies, and from retrospective studies of the large AF trials. And whereas in ASRA, they also incorporate a lot of uh, PK pharmacokinetic uh, studies done in uh, healthy volunteers, for example. So you know, there they have a broader array of, of evidence where they investigated doses, frankly, that are, are just too high. So 
I just want to leave us with the with that message that we're we're consistent and, and forgive me for taking a long time with this answer, but I think it's an important one. So at the end of the day, how do we reconcile uh, if if there are people, and this happens in my institution, that are very aligned with the ASRI recommendations, we don't sort of try to twist their elbows in a manner of speaking, because the differences are, 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 are subtle, two days versus three days. The approach that we've always taken with all anticoagulants, whether it's heparin, low molecular heparin, warfarin, et cetera, is to have that interruption period that will allow safe surgery, but not to extend it beyond that. So we could say three days, somebody could say five, others could say a week, and it, it starts a bit of a slippery slope. Uh, so I, I, I welcome others' comments, but uh, again, my apologies for the long response. Very important question. And, and, and I, I think, think it, oh, I was I just, just want to add, add Okay, go ahead, Bill. So just if you look at the guidelines at the very beginning, we do discuss the fact that there are outliers out there that may have poor elimination because of drug interactions or genetic profiling and such. And obviously many of these could have been excluded from some of the trials. Good, just keep that in mind when you're making these decisions that there are those outliers. Uh, they're not the common situation, but you should pay attention to that so that you don't end up with something you don't want. That's great. Alex, I want to turn to you and, you know, you really highlighted the importance of that table that sort of outlines the, the risk of thromboembolism. And, and, you know, I can remember back to my days in training, that being sort of such a central table. You know, I'm thinking even back to the 2008 version of these guidelines you guys all did, um, but they've updated and they've changed over time. And I wanted to ask you about a couple of them that are in this most recent version, you know, in that high risk category, you now have a term there called antiphospholipid antibodies. And you know, this is something I think all of us as clinicians are seeing a lot. What did you guys mean when you put that in there? Is that somebody with a formal diagnosis of APLS? Is that somebody who's had a prior clot and has labs? Is that somebody who just has a positive lab that was checked? And what does that practically mean? How do we apply that piece of it? I think it's a relevant question, Jeff. And, and really, when we look at the, the high-risk criteria, what we really mean are patients with severe thrombophilic states, right, or severe acquired hypercoagulable states. So it really, uh, for antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, it, it's truly the, the patient that meets the clinical definition of the syndrome, meaning that they have the persistent elevations of the various antiphospholipid antibodies as defined by uh, societies, and they've had a clinical event. So they've already declared themselves as a high-risk patient. Uh, this does not include patients who have uh, serologically positive uh, autoantibodies and, and no clinical events, or, or they're still, they don't have evidence of persistent right, um, autoantibodies as well. And this, for example, could happen in COVID. We've seen that a lot of times in yeah. COVID that these can cause that. So we really mean uh, a, good, a good example is homozygosity, right? Uh, for the, you know, uh, uh, for factor five Leiden uh, or, or double heterozygosity or antiphospholipid syndrome. So this is really the spirit of what we mean by high risk in the VT situation. You know, that's really helpful. Grounding it in the person who's had a thrombotic event. And then when you do go to explore why that might push them into this antiphospholipid antibody sort of group there. Does the same apply to the other group that I see listed, which is associated with vena cava filter? You know, we see a lot of people who have filters put in for a whole bunch of reasons. Is the filter the problem or is it somebody who's had a clot with a filter that's really that high-risk patient? Yeah, you know, Jeff, that, that's a very subtle uh, but very important point. So again, um, when these first iteration of these thrombobulgous stratification. Um, we were younger men at, 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 in those times. I, I remember that well. Uh, you know, the data there uh, really was data based on the old permanent IVC filters um, and the risks of uh, IVC filter thrombosis, especially in the cancer population. Now, of course, mm -hmm. the, the filter, uh, uh, the, the, the field of filter implantation has really uh, remarkably changed in the last 10 years or so. So now we're having um, non-permanent uh, temporary filters placed in, in multiple situations. So the spirit of that, again, um, much as I said before, is that patients already declared themselves as high risk because they, they had a thrombotic event um, around placement of the filter or why uh, 
uh, filter was placed, and especially, especially uh, that that really refers to the patients uh, in in oncologic situations with uh, with active cancer or recent cancer or other very high risk phenotypes, such as, for example, antiphospholipid syndrome, et cetera. So that's the spirit of of where that comes from. So, so what I'm hearing you say is that just because somebody has a filter doesn't automatically mean they're high risk and need bridging. You got to understand more of the clinical picture of why that filters in and what else is going on. Exactly. Great. Hey, Bill, I want to turn to you. You know, many of us who, who work in anticoagulation think of these guidelines as being about anticoagulation, but we forget that there's a whole area of antiplatelet therapy that, that is addressed here. Um, and, and one of the questions that I know as a cardiologist, I often get answered is, well, if I have to stop my P2Y12 inhibitor, do I need to bridge that patient with Kangrelor? And the guidelines here were pretty clear that that should not be a routine practice. But of course, people always want to know, well, when is it appropriate? And I'm wondering from your perspective, what would be the kind of situation where you would say, maybe we do need to go ahead and use a short-term agent like Kangrelor uh, sort of to, to bridge while that P2Y12 inhibitor is, is coming off before uh, a surgical procedure? Yeah, so actually I have a fair amount of experience and we actually published a paper on this using tire Fiban. And uh, so in practice, a lot of times we have to think about how the stent risk is. The, the cardiologists obviously, as you know, do not want uh, uh, instant thrombosis occurring. We're doing complex PCI procedures now. And uh, so when you have these fresh stents, these are not stents that were say placed more than three months ago. That seems to be one of my clinical cutoffs, but it's also where's the stent located, the number of stents and the nature of the stents. So you have to get a little bit more granular in making these decisions for these patients. And uh, it's going to be a little bit more case-by-case -case basis, but there are those patients that are super high risk shortly after stent placement, and there's a procedure that now needs to be undertaken, uh, and it's going to be delayed for a certain period of time, then you might consider uh, using a parenteral antiplatelet agent for bridging those patients because of your concern for the stent. But obviously, people who have had stents that are chronic, they've been there for a long period of time, there really isn't probably a need to do this uh, um, bridging approach with a parenteral antiplatelet agent. Yeah, that's helpful. You know, I, I often get this question and my first response is, do we really need to do the surgery or could we put it off long enough to just hold the antiplatelet? But when we can't, then I'm thinking about those left main stents, those prox LAD stents, right? The ones that are really high risk. And, 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 and as you said, it's very selective when you might use a, a short-term agent. That, that's, that's helpful to have that in the guidelines. Yeah, just so you can maybe weigh in, Jeff. I mean, to me, if it's a very distal stent, I'm not as concerned about it per se in practice, although the, the cardiologist should probably weigh in in its decision process if it's not on a cardiology-related service. Yeah, I think that that's, that's really important. That multidisciplinary discussion is, is critical. Jim, I want to turn back to you. You know, uh, we've gotten a lot of questions from the audience here about how to manage DOAX in that perioperative space. And, and, and a lot of them really get to the question about renal function. And we use renal function to help us dose DOAX, especially in AFib, right? We think about our dose suggestions. Um, does that apply in the periop space? It seems like from the pause study, it really didn't, except for dabigatran. And, and can you help us understand why, and, and you know, as we're going out to explain to others, why renal function shouldn't play a role in how long we're holding it? Uh, thank you, Jeff. That's a great question. And I think we're learning a lot in general terms about DOAX and impaired renal function outside of the perioperative setting, uh, especially with the 10A inhibitors. Um, in the pause trial, uh, this did not really inform the management apart from uh, a small minority of patients who were on dabigatran and had impaired renal function. Um, so we felt that the degree of renal function was not uh, so great that it would change a general paradigm in terms of interruption and re resumption. Uh, in support of this, we did not find in subsequent uh, analyses that renal function was a predictor of perioperative bleeding or thromboembolism for that matter, although the concern would be more about bleeding because, you know, if you've got impaired renal function, maybe you need to interrupt longer so patients don't bleed. But we did not find that. So I think um, as we learn more about renal function and DOACs in general, I think the message is that 
maybe it's not as important, especially when the clearance is only between 25 to 33% to for the most commonly used OX. Got it. Got it. That's I, the... Yeah, I'd like to interject. This is an actual question that we had a lot of discussion about. We really took a lot of careful time and efforts to think about it. The PAWS really depicts not really a need. The levels are described in PAWS and such, but there are certain severe renal impairment populations. And also when you add in a drug interaction on top of the renal failure, that could become a significant factor where you might start actually with a higher level than you think in the duration of hold may not be sufficient, but these are outlier populations, mm -hmm. but we still may want to deal with them. But the general average person and such, it seems to, and, and for super, especially surgeries that are not as high risk for bleeding, uh, it would hold up with what we're trying to say for the general uh, approach. But there are outliers out there we still always should consider. Yeah, it's, it's uh, one of the phrases I think we often hear is guidelines are the place to start, but they're by no means the only way to practice. And so it's a good starting point and then think about what your individual patient needs. That's helpful. Well, Jeff, Alex, right, they're, 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 they're not yeah. the places to end. They're a good place to start, but not the place to end. <laughs> That's a great way to put it. That's yeah. a great way to put it. Yeah. Hey, Alex, I want to turn to you. One of the, I think personally, one of the biggest changes in these guidelines is the approach to mechanical valves. And, and there've been a lot of questions from our audience about that. Um, and I'm wondering if you could walk us through a little bit you know, we see the recommendation for those low risk aortic valve patients that maybe don't need bridging anymore. We've now got some evidence that's coming. What's it going to take for us to actually change practice? I, I think for so many clinicians, mechanical valve equals bridging, and they just don't even think about it. How are we going to actually take these guidelines and start to shift that practice a bit? What, what are your thoughts in that space? Well, if you believe um, the literature will take about seven years. Um, <laughs> before, <laughs> from the publication of guidelines to implementation of clinical practice, as I hope I had introduced our audience, uh, these guidelines are, protect, are potentially practice changing because not only for the mechanical heart valve population, but in my view, for the atrial fibrillation population, which is the largest chunk of patients on chronic warfarin, um, these guidelines, I think, will have tremendous implications. So, when you look at the actual numbers, only about 20% of patients with AF or mechanical heart valve indications truly are in the high risk category. So what we're saying is, is th th these are the patients, you know, uh, that's the low hanging fruit. So if you truly have a high risk AF patient, uh, for example, very high CHADS VAS scores, or more importantly, a patient who's had a periprocedural stroke or thrombotic event, right, with atrial fibrillation, um, those or, or mechanical heart valve, that's an older caged ball type valve, you know, or of course, uh, uh, a patient with uh, a valve in any position who's, who's uh, succumbed to a thrombotic event. These are all the patient phenotypes that we truly label as, as high risk. And if you choose to bridge that patient, that's on you and that's acceptable, you know. What we really are, what we mean is number one, not all patients with atrial fibrillation need to be bridged. And I have to tell you, uh, in my view, based on my reading of the literature in the last decade, there was a strong bias in the cardiology community to bridge. I remember the ACCHA guidelines in 2014 recommended bridging therapy, okay, based on the exact same evidence um, that we had in the 2012 CHESS guidelines, where we suggested that there would be patient groups that would not benefit from bridging therapy. And as I mentioned, the way the bridge trial was set up is that the experimental group was the no bridging group. This is how much bridging was ingrained, right, in the medical yep. community. So the first thing I want to say is for the vast majority of patients at moderate risk, I think what these guidelines are telling us over 50% of the populations, you don't need to bridge, period. Okay, and these include um, aortic valve patients or even some of the newer mitral valve patients, for example, onyx valves is a good example. So mm -hmm. unless if you have a modern low profile valve, uh, you're a young patient, you have no uh, previous history of thrombotic event, you don't have any of the other cardiovascular risk factors, these indeed would be the patient. I just saw a patient actually last week who fit that profile, and I did not recommend bridging therapy for that patient. These are the patients that we're talking about that don't need to be routinely bridged. Uh, and I think that's the important message is, is really look at the moderate risk population first, right? Make sure you have protocols and guidelines that now with, uh, with this iteration of the CHESS guidelines, you say these patients don't need bridging. Mm 
And then for the patients in the high risk, um, you know, uh, high risk uh, uh, um, uh, conditions, and I think you should look at them based on a case by case approach. What it means is that you shouldn't blanket bridging therapy for all mechanical heart valve patients. Yeah, I think that's helpful. And Bill, I want to turn to you because several people have asked questions really about how do we get this into practice and, and what can the anticoagulation clinic pharmacist or nurse or maybe the, the pharmacist who's rounding on the service, how can they influence the way these guidelines and recommendations are being applied? And I'm wondering if you have thoughts or recommendations, how do we get the physicians to sign off on this evidence-based guideline practice? What, what would you recommend to folks? Well, that's the irony is that actually now that this has come out, I'm rewriting all our policies for bridging in for our institution and we'll present it according to, to multidisciplinary committee and get all the key physician groups to sign off on it. Once you get uh, all the key players in your institution on board and they realize the risk benefit, then uh, you can actually institutionalize this based on the evidence but also give flexibility to any concerns that the uh, unique uh, clinical practice groups may bring up, adapt them to your institution accordingly. But it, it needs good communication with all the parties involved, not only the clinic and what they make recommendations for, but also what happens in the ho hospital and also some of the stuff we deal with about restarting anticoagulation after the procedures and how we approach it. So you look at the big picture and you look at the optimal way, but now we have a great evidence-based document as a basis to form our policies and then change your order sets and everything accordingly to fit your policy and how you're going to approach it. Yeah, so, so policy change and, and just, you know, taking ownership, I think, is a key and, and, and having that conversation both before the patient ever shows up and when you have those patients there and, and that repetition is key. Jim, I want to turn to you. We're getting lots of questions about antiplatelet therapy, and, and this was obviously a big one in, in the guidelines here. You know, there's been a general reduction in the use of aspirin. I think overall we're seeing less primary prevention aspirin, less combination therapy aspirin, but aspirin's still a really common antiplatelet. And, you know, what would be a couple of your take-home messages about how we should be approaching aspirin therapy in the periop space? Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Let me first talk briefly about just patients on single antiplatelet therapy, and this is typically ASA, 81 milligrams, and the ACCP made a recommendation in patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery to continue uh, ASA perioperatively, which may have raised some eyebrows. Uh, I can tell you this is one of the few domains where there was not complete consensus among the panelists, I think reflecting some of the um, about how to interpret the evidence. I mean, nonetheless, the, the, the recommendations were based on mainly on the PEP and the POIS2 trials, both landmark important trials. But it also looks at how we interpreted the evidence. For example, in the POIS2 trial, there were concerns that uh, a high proportion of patients were using NSAIDs, and this may have attenuated some of the, the benefits of continuing antiplatelet therapy. Moreover, in that trial, if you look at the ASA continuation stratum, there was no significant difference in major bleeding. So uh, having said that, we do have a caveat that in, you know, we do want to consider interrupting in patients at high risk uh, for bleeding. So you know, I welcome readers to look at that part and uh, interpret it as they, they, as they see fit. The other big area, the two other big areas were cardiac surgery, which um, we essentially had similar recommendations as previously. And the new area, I think, as as uh, Bill had alluded to, involve patients who were receiving uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. And, and here, this is an area that we urgently need more research. And uh, our, our recommendation, which was conditional, that to continue the ASA, aligning with the recommendation in non-cardiac surgery and bypass surgery for that matter, but interrupting the P2Y12 inhibitor, typically five to seven days, uh, is based on you know, rather weak observational data and as Bill alluded to, can be modified to vet depending on individual patient circumstances, number of stents, whether it's a critical lesion and so on. So uh, yes, we've made a lot of progress, but there's still a lot of room for improvement to inform best, best practices. That's, can that's I really helpful. I'd like to yeah. comment on the five to seven days so everybody's aware. Like when you look at clopidogrel or uh, prazogrel, 
their effects are gone within six to eight hours after the dose. And all you're waiting for that five to seven day period is for platelets to fully regain their complete effectiveness at close to 100%. But you know, if you go three days, you've gained 50% with those agents. So keep that in mind that the drug is no longer there in, uh, impacting the platelets, but you are getting higher amounts of platelets. And you may have some window of doing the surgery earlier if you're not concerned about having full return of platelet function. Ticagra is a little different, but just, I'll just add that caveat with that five to seven day period. Awesome. That's, that's really helpful. I want to close with a couple really brief but very practical questions that have come in. And Jim, I'll pose the first one to you. You know, when we look at that protocol for stopping the DOAX pre-op that really came from the PAUSE study, um, I want to use the case. How do we figure out the exact time to tell a patient to stop their pill? So you used a case of a patient who's having surgery on Friday. Let's, let's call it 10 a.m. And let's say we decide to stop her apixaban two days beforehand, a 48 hour hold. Practically speaking, what does that mean? When does she take a dose? When does she not take a dose? Can you help us translate that? Yes, and I think as we all know in this space, simplicity is of paramount importance. So we've tried to keep the wording simple. That's why we say two days off. So that means the last dose is on Tuesday, you're off Wednesday, you're off Thursday. Of course, you're off the day of surgery. and um, I can't emphasize the importance of that enough alongside communication. We can do that better now in an EMR world between different specialties and colleagues. And, and Alex, to you, the same kind of question, if I'm doing a warfarin patient and I'm going to bridge them with a, a low molecular weight heparin, you know, again, surgeries on Friday, when do they get that low molecular weight heparin and when do I stop it so they can go and have, have surgery? Do they take that low molecular weight heparin right up until Thursday but beforehand? How do you practically operationalize that? So the, what we've seen in the RCT data is that a full 24 hour stop uh, would be optimal. Of course, we do have conditions that you can give half dose of the mm -hmm. daily dose should you choose for flexibility, but, but preferably um, you hold that low molecular weight heparin pre-procedure for a full 24 hours. There, there is some indirect data from uh, 10A, level, uh, uh, 10A levels that you have accumulated 10A levels if you stop sooner than those 24 hours. And this is what I mean where I think the bridge trial really validated that kind of, of, uh, of uh, paradigm because we saw in the no bridging arm a very low major bleed rate using this approach. That's just, great. Yeah, you know, just one thing real quickly to add into that, though, is that you know, these are elective surgeries we're talking about, and there's also a lot of data about giving some sort of anticoagulant prior to an elective surgery being done, mostly in Europe, but also keep that in mind that in these high-risk patients, there's also that option, not as often practiced in the United States as much as other places in the world, but uh, those are other considerations, too, unless, Alex, Jim, you want to comment on that? Yeah, I think the, the key is, is that's really not based on any high quality evidence. So I think that the key part of our recommendations that was really based on, on high quality evidence from randomized trials. So I'm aware of, of, of multiple approaches, but I think the, the key message from ours is that we, we, we gave our recommendations based on the best available evidence to date. Now that evidence can change, and of course it will change, but this is a synthesis of what we've seen in, with the best available evidence. Perfect. Well, thank you, everyone. This has been an amazing discussion. And Liz, I'll turn it over to you to close. So much, Jeff. And thank you to all of our speakers. Oh, my goodness. Doctors Jim Duquettis, Alex Baropoulos, Bill Dager, and Jeff. You guys are amazing. I'm so grateful. This These guidelines were published last month. I'm so really grateful that you were able to pull this together and share your expertise with our members as Jeff said, we had over 1,800 people register, which really speaks to the need for these new guidelines, updated guidelines, and the impact they're, they're going to have. As Alex, as you said, it's practice changing. So thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. And if you enjoyed this webinar, please join us for our upcoming webinars. We have a great webinar in honor of PAD Awareness Month, which is September um, health disparities in PAD, what to know as an anticoagulation provider. We have a phenomenal, very special speaker, Dr. Faccaridi, who's doing amazing work in, Miss in Mississippi with the Black community trying to prevent amputations, improve, um, increase awareness of PAD, and improve treatment. So that's, you're in for a treat if you join us for that.
And then we also will be speaking about our brand new anticoagulation stewardship playbook. Um, just a bit on that, we just released it a few weeks ago. We did it in partnership with NQF and it has all the tips and strategies you could need to create an anticoagulation stewardship program at your institution. It's available for free download both on the AC Forum website and at the NQF store. So please download it and join us for those webinars. Also to advance stewardship, we have a brand new ASHP just accredited a brand new novel PGY2 pharmacy residency in thrombosis and hemostasis management. And if any of you know how what a challenge that was to do, it's really rare that they accredit new residencies. So we're thrilled that it's in our field. And the AC Forum will be awarding grants to institutions to launch a program. So the grant is actually due tomorrow. So you still have time for this round or think about it for next year. And you can learn more about it on our website. Uh, we have two other last things I'd like to mention. We have a virtual boot camp coming up. It will be broadcast live October 7th and 8th, and then also available for 30 days after if you can't make those days. And it's a very well received, very compact, very uh, lots of information that you need to know. So please register for that. And then fingers crossed, or actually I'm not crossing my fingers anymore. It will be live in April, um, April, 2023. We will be in person in San Francisco for our national conference. So please join us in person there. Registration will open soon. And lastly, I'd like to thank our uh, corporate sponsors for making this webinar program possible. Thank you everyone and have a great day.